Hi listeners, Jason here. We are excited to finally announce registrations for the biggest psych health and safety community event ever. The inaugural The Psych Health and Safety Conference will be held at the Sofitel Wentworth Sydney June 19 to 20, 2024 and offer concurrent virtual attendance. It'll feature live podcast recordings with OG researchers, including Christina Maslach and Michael Leiter of Burnout fame, Psych Health and Safety USA podcast host I, David Daniels, Australian super experts, including the likes of David Burrows, a special 10-year anniversary integrated approaches to workplace mental health panel with authors Tony LaMontagna, Angela Martin and Kat Page, hand-picked case studies from organisations doing it well, and a very special interview with plaintiff Zaggy Kozarov by Catherine Dunlop on that High Court case which we previously covered on the podcast. This event will sell out. Get in quick to secure tickets at early bird prices for the two-day conference, pre-conference masterclasses and the VIP dinner. The first 200 in-person registrations also get a copy of her latest book, The Burnout Challenge, signed by Christina Maslach herself. Find out more and register at www.psychhealthandsafetyconference.com. Now, on to this episode. From Flourish DX, this is the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. With workplace mental health becoming a safety prerogative, this is the source of information on psychological injury prevention and health promotion. Welcome to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. My name is Jason Venshi, and I'm one of the hosts of the show. The aim of the podcast is to rapidly increase the knowledge and application of psychological health and safety in workplaces worldwide. To help with this, we have regular guests from around the world who are leading the way in this important area. But before I introduce our guest and topic for today, allow me to introduce my co-host, Joel Mitchell. How are you today, Joel? Am I, am I allowed to look at you now? <laughs> you can look at me now. Thank you. Thank, thank you for looking away. It did actually help a lot. Good. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. Um, I was wondering if me looking away would also make you laugh. It did a little bit, but yeah. less than you looking at me. <laughs> I just, I'm just a giggler, Joel. Like, no, you know, so. it's, yeah, true. That's true. You do just... um. Walk through the office giggling. Yeah, it could be worse. It could be like Brendan and just have a frown on my face. That's time. true. That's true. Poor grumpy Brendan. So what's going on in your life, Joel? Well, Georgia has joined the team here in Perth. Yeah, Gigi. Yeah. Um, so that's that's exciting to have uh, another member of the team here in Perth and just another member of the team generally. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's pretty good. Yeah, I think uh, in the next month or so of podcast, people are going to hear maybe three more introductions to the team, hopefully. Yeah, probably, so, yep. yep. <laughs> it's, uh, it's growing rapidly. How are you Still coping? Um, too much things, not enough brain, uh, as I said the other day, yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully enjoy your holiday over to Quebec uh, next week. My holiday? Yeah. Oh, no, it's Montreal as well, isn't it? Yeah. It's Montreal, not Quebec, yeah, and it's, Canada, it's so not a same holiday. Thing, same, same. No, not a holiday. Yeah. Oh, sounds like a holiday to me. Um, cool. Well, hopefully enjoy it and uh, you make it back in one piece so we can record our next podcast episode. Thanks for your priorities Actually, we, we might do a call out at this point as well before we lose people on the episode because not everyone makes it all the way to the end, right? I mean, they will with this next wow. case, no doubt. I'm, like, I'm not, <laughs> not setting us up for failure at all. But um, we would love more guests and recommendations from our community on guests to have on the podcast. So um, we would particularly love to hear from practitioners who are actually applying psychosocial risk management with an organization. Um, so if you've got any recommendations or if you feel like you've got something to share on the podcast that you think the community would uh, appreciate, please do reach out um, and uh, you can do that via LinkedIn or, or email. So yeah, we'd love to have some more uh, guests and practitioners in particular. Yep. Um, and yeah, don't don't be embarrassed or feel like what you're doing isn't good enough. Um, we'll be the judge of that. Yeah, we'll we'll <laughs> let you know if it's not good enough. <laughs> no kidding, we um we're very friendly and judgmental as we mentioned before. Let's just do well. I'm happy with most things. I'm only judgmental to Jason. Okay, yeah, let's go with that. Um, anyway, our uh, guest for today has been patiently waiting, so we should probably let him in. Yes. Okay. He has a PhD in psychology, has written a book, it's on my bucket list to do that one day, uh, authored over 150 peer-reviewed journal articles, not on my bucket list, and has worked in both consulting and academia. He is a professor at the University of Melbourne and the Melbourne Business School, honorary professor at the University of Queensland and director and principal psychologist at Psychological Safety Australia. 
a warm welcome to the podcast, Brock Bastian. Thank you, uh, Jason, and thank you, Joel. Thank you. Yeah, no, great to have you on. Uh, like I said, we've this is like I'm a, I'm a long time listener, first time talker, <laughs> <I'm> an interviewer <laughs> of you. So uh, yeah, really interested uh, to hear your thoughts today on the topic. So, um, Brock, what podcast do you like to listen to? Yeah, good question. Um, I, I mean, look, I like anything uh, like anything from Adam Grant. I think Adam Grant's a, you know a great thinker in the space, and uh, particularly liked his book rethink and so you know the rethinking podcast is a good one um you know i think in, in, you know lisa long and on this working life on abc is always you know good and interviewing you know leading edge scientific writers and thinkers um around workplace um i think which is great and i mean amantha rimba is pretty good as well with how i work and some of those tips and tools and strategies for for you know more productive and uh more efficient working strategies. So yeah, maybe those those three are quite good. Yep, there are definitely all popular ones from our um, our guests. Yeah. Uh, we keep uh, calling out Adam Grant to come and uh, join us as a guest, but so far we haven't heard from his people. <laughs> yeah, he was on our list of uh, key people to have at our conference coming up next month, uh, but he was, let's just say, a little out of budget. Mm. Um, <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> and given he was just over for the growth faculty earlier this year as kind of like, yeah, might be too much Adam Grant. Not that I don't think any of us would agree that there could is such a thing, but like perhaps. Too much for Australia. Too much for Australia. We're too small. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so Brock, can you tell us about your professional career, please? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, I'm an academic obviously and, uh, you know, Professor University of Melbourne. So that's been something I've been doing and building for for quite a while you know in terms of the research and um and yeah you know that takes some time to to develop but alongside of that i've always uh you know in addition to theory and and research really enjoyed keeping my hand in the practice and practical elements um I've for a very long time had a small private practice that i've maintained i i, I keep doing that um you know a few hours each week but it's something that i i enjoy and of course, also, uh, you know, quite a bit in the organisational consulting space, particularly more recently um, and, and, you know, developing and uh, running Psychological Safety Australia since uh, 2018. So um, that's, again, something that's been probably a, a more recent um, passion and focus for me. But um, again, really, really like that, that connection between, you know, research but then also the application, you know, and seeing that land in, in very practical and applied ways. Yeah, and it's uh, always good when academics also work in um, in reality, I guess. Um. <laughs> <laughs> outside, outside the <laughs> ivory those, tower, so to speak. Yeah, well, for, you know, for those of us whose job it is to translate research in, into practice, it certainly helps when uh, when the academics doing the research have, have a sense of um, practicability. Yeah, yeah. And look, it goes both ways as well, I think, you know, being able to get out there and be in touch with what, you know, what people are thinking and doing. Yeah, that helps too in, in, in the reverse direction. That need more research. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But definitely, uh, yeah, I think a lot of academics need to understand that only a small percentage of undergraduates will ever go into academia at the end of their degree. And they probably do need to pitch it more towards the practical rather than the, hey, this is awesome research. Yes, research. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. And I, and I, th I think, you know, I mean, one of the things in, uh, in so, I mean, certainly in my experience, you know, a lot of, a lot of students coming through, they, they have the interest in the research or, or want to be a clinical psychologist. And, of course, both of those are very good things. But seeing the, you know, the broader picture and many of those, I think, really interesting applications, um, and, and certainly as a social psychologist in terms of my research, uh, you know, working in that that organisational space has been interesting just to be able to really apply some of that, that thinking around groups, group dynamics, culture, you know, well-being um, in, in those sorts of contexts. So um, so helping helping students to see that and, and the really interesting stuff that can be done uh, outside of clinical and, and research, I think, is great. Hey. Yeah, actually, on that, Brock, uh, I remember, well, if I can remember back, because it was over two decades ago to my undergraduate, um, very early on, we'll introduce to social psychology and developmental psychology, um, cognitive psychology. Um, I don't think I actually um, saw organizational psychology until maybe third year of my undergrad. 
Is it something that is explicitly introduced to students at an earlier stage in their degrees these days? It's actually something that, I mean, we don't even offer it at, at, at Melbourne anymore as a, as a master's degree. Um, it is offered elsewhere. So it's, it's one of those interesting ones, isn't it, where, where I think um, in, in terms of practice, clinical has got a very clear domain of practice because it's got the Medicare funding behind it. You know, there's a certain sort of threshold in terms of you must have a clinical psychology qualification to work in certain settings. Um, but many of the other uh, specialisations in psychology, it doesn't have that sort of threshold, um, you know, to be able to work in that space. So it, it seems to be, um, yeah, slightly different. And, and I mean, that's that's in, in some ways a shame. I mean, I think the clinical application is obviously incredibly important. But um, yeah, so certainly certainly the training and, and I suppose people working in the organisational space are a bit more of a broader bunch in that sense too, aren't they? There's, there's a, a range of... Uh, a range of, I guess, um, educational backgrounds, a range of directions that people come at that from. Yeah, uh, it'll be it'll be interesting. I think um, my story is not too dissimilar from many people who go into organisational psychology, and that's that they stumble across it, you know, yeah. uh, at some point in their undergrad. Um, but I don't think many people go into psychology thinking about organisational psychology as a career path at the outset. Mm. Yeah, funnily enough, um, I remember doing. Like in, in year 10, you do kind of the career counselling or, or whatever to think about pathways. And I remember saying to the guy at school, whoever he was, that I wanted to study psychology. And so he looked it up in his manual and then he kind of looked at organisational psychology and was saying, oh, that's really interesting. And I went, that's boring. Um, <laughs> so, you know, um, take that 15-year-old me. Yeah, yeah, take that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, FYI, not boring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, Brock, then tell us a bit about your key areas of research then at Uni Melbourne. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, my research is is very much, I, I guess, in the domain of social psychology. So, I guess, uh, you know, quite broad, uh, broadly focused uh, around um, human decision making, culture, well being. I, I do quite a bit of work around um, ethics or behavioural ethics, the psychology of ethical decision making, uh, across into yeah topics like happiness uh, and well being, and, and I guess in a sense having a quite a focus on on culture um, right through that. Also that that sort of behavioural insights piece, I suppose, or understanding some of those those environmental and contextual factors that impact on you know, how people make decisions, um, some of the blind spots in there as well. So, yeah, it's it's really, I think, uh, it's quite theoretically focused, a lot of the research, um, which I quite enjoy. Um, but then that does allow me to apply it, uh, you know, broadly in, in various domains. Um, yeah, so, so, yeah, very much, very much, I suppose, I'm, look, I'm the director of the Ethics and Wellbeing Research Hub, and that probably describes a little bit about, you know, the kinds of topics I'm focused on, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, if you had to pick your favourite child, because uh, because your area of research is quite broad, what what would be mm. your favourite bit? At least at the moment, what are you enjoying the most? Like delving into. Um, at the moment, certainly doing quite a bit more. And look, to be honest, at this stage, I'm, I think I'm more driven by what my PhD students are interested in as much as anything else. But there's there's certainly a lot of activity in uh, in in the in the uh, I guess the behavioural ethics space and, and thinking around and looking at those sorts of topics. We're starting to venture into understanding, I suppose, some of those large, um, you know, large societal-wide conflicts such as uh, polarisation and trust, um, and trying to think around how do you how do you sort of build uh, well insight into the into the factors that are leading to that. How do you think about um, addressing those sorts of things? Again, those sorts of issues are not only relevant for organisations, but really. Um, for, for, for society as a whole, for social fabric. Um, you know, we, we know that Australia is, is on a path to polarisation. We're sort of seeing the impact of that in the States. Um, and so really understanding how do you manage those sorts of disagreements and how do you talk across those divides and how do you have those sorts of conversations where people can actually hear each other, I think is really, really important territory in some of the, some of the direction we're currently heading in, um, which obviously has implications for wellbeing as well, because when you can't, when you can't manage that well or when it's not managed well, a polarised society is not great for people's mental health either. 
Yeah, and and even like the polarized um, ideals or positions that employees versus employers find themselves in as well. From uh, you know what what is experienced versus what is perceived as as the experience. But uh, you know that polarization stuff is really interesting. I remember seeing um one of those recent social media um, documentaries, and they talked about how social media is c- kind of creating, particularly like the American example in politics. You know feeding up people like certain things to reinforce opinions which go very left wing and right wing very quickly so yeah yeah very interesting yeah Yeah. and and, i mean i think you know most of the issues that do become polarized are the the moral or ethical issues and i think they they cover quite a broad range of of, uh you know concerns and topics but um yeah understanding i suppose yeah how, how is that you know how's that playing out and uh again what can we do to quite to try and Try and address it a bit early on. Again, I think you know one of the interesting statistics that came out of the Edelman Trust barometer recently was seventy four percent of Australians said they wouldn't help somebody who strongly disagreed with their their um, viewpoint, um, which is you know a little bit worrying if you think you wouldn't actually lend a person a hand if they if they disagree with you fundamentally on something that you think is an important topic. Um, yeah. So that that sort of starts to get at that you know that fabric of the society we live in and and and, and how that. It, uh, yeah, how that plays out more broadly. Yeah, no, no, super interesting stuff, and we could talk about that all day. But that's not we the topic could. of today. It's not the topic <laughs> of today. Um, I've actually been thinking about the impact of of streaming on that sort of polarization as well, and the lack of those. Like, if you think even sort of twenty years ago, the popular shows that the majority of people in the Western world, anyway, were all kind of watching collectively, and that doesn't happen anymore there's all you know streaming services and people can really customize their viewing for what interests them or what reflects their own values back to them so there's potentially not that um challenge of values or that normalizing of groups outside of your own um in group going no, on and building tolerance or, or the willingness to even accommodate or, or hear those perspectives i think is really critical and we're losing a bit of that too yeah mm. anyway not the topic of today. No. Um, so I guess talking about um, taking research and then applying it in practice, how do you do that? Like how do you translate your research into the work that you do with uh, with your client organisations? Yes, yeah, so a lot of the work that I do is um, I suppose culture is a really critical um, part of, of uh, you know, probably the approach that I use, you know, across a range of space. So I certainly certainly work broadly, I think, in, in, in and around risk management. Um, so whether that's risk for uh, uh, ethical decision-making or poor ethical decision-making, so, you know, across into things like integrity. Um, but then, then also across into to mental health uh, and how culture can feed into the way that we manage mental health in the workplace as well. You know, certainly, and, and I know that, you know, that um, both of you are right in there in terms of that shift to looking at the upstream sort of factors that we need to be aware of at work and seeing those contextual and cultural influences on people. And uh, I think, you know, certainly as a social psychologist, being able to come in and see a lot of that happening and also, um, yeah, I guess that early intervention and prevention approach uh, and, and looking at those sorts of sort those, those, those yeah, those broader factors uh, and, and starting to target those. So certainly, um, yeah, helping leaders to understand how to build uh, cultures that enable conversations around difficult topics, enable you know people to speak up around uh, issues that are impacting on them, uh, to understand how to manage uh, some of those some of those uh, perhaps ethical issues in the workplace, which I think does you know flow across not only into the sorts of decisions people are making in you know around their roles or uh, or, or client facing decisions but how we're treating each other and how we're looking after each other at work I think is a is a critical ethical issue too and um, yeah being able to talk openly and, and have those conversations around that so it really is about I think a fair bit of it is is capability development um, and and very much focused on understanding the role of culture. And using that behavioural insights approach, I think often, you know, human behaviour is very complex. And so understanding well, what are the factors that lead people to do what they do to make the decisions that they make, and then using that, that approach to look upstream and really be able to identify those, those early things you want to target to, to, to manage those, you know, to make better decisions, to, to manage those risks, to create better outcomes. 
Yeah. How do you find the, uh, oh, let me rephrase that. Have you seen a shift in uh, how receptive leaders are to having that conversation in sort of recent years as we've seen more focus on psychosocial requirements? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think in, in a way um, it's given teeth to the, to the conversation, hasn't it? It's it sort of enabled people, you know, you can actually now use some of that risk language before it was, you know, look, it'd be really good and be nice, you know, if we could, you know, maybe create an environment and, you know, make sure that people are looked after well. And, and now you've got some real teeth in those conversations where you say, well, look, you know, this is, there's an obligation here. There's risk. There's a risk that you need to manage here. Um, but of course you don't want to, you know, one one of the things I think can can easily happen, and you want to avoid, is the whole thing becoming a compliance focused exercise. Um, certainly in the ethics space, this happens all the time. So you know, when when organisations want to think about um, building integrity, they, they they sort of think from that very compliance focused approach, um, and and really that's not going to achieve the outcomes. It's not going to build those capabilities that you want for people to make good decisions um, or to to be able to you know contribute to the organisation in the ways you'd want them to. And I think it's the same with, um, yeah, with certainly the psychosocial risk space, um, you know, helping organisations to see that, well, there is a risk management piece here, but actually if you turn that inside out, you know, everything you're trying to achieve is also what makes a flourishing, positive organisation where people want to, you know, turn up to work and and uh, enjoy being at work. Fair. So, um if we switch the conversation then to a particular area of research that you've got, uh, which is toxic positivity, um, uh, it's it's something that I guess has been thrown around a bit, but maybe you can help us out by just giving us a, a definition. What does toxic positivity mean? Yeah, so it's it's a it's a term that actually has come out since uh, since I've been doing the research, my own work on this, and um, I don't actually know who who came up with it, but I know there's a book on it now. Um, and I think it, I think it kind of illustrates that this, this is a, it's a bit more of an awareness around this, this kind of stuff. Um, that we now we've actually got a term for it. So toxic positivity is, I suppose, that that it describes that pressure that people feel to maintain an upbeat, positive um, mindset or, or emotional appearance and expression. Um, and in that sense, the toxic part to that, because of course it's great to be happy, it's good to be positive, but the toxic part is about that. You know that the pressure, the felt pressure, or that that um, that push to do that is actually invalidating what is really the authentic human experience and minimising some of those less positive elements of that, which of course are really important across a range of uh, you know across a range of fronts to to uh, to to lean into to to experience as part of the human experience. But you know, from a toxic positivity standpoint, um, the toxic part is just not. Not that you know, not not enabling that authenticity. Yeah, and I'm um, uh, assuming then that this has, uh, yeah, impacts on the individual workers who feel like they have to be uh, more positive at work, even though that might not necessarily reflect, I guess, um, how they feel at that point in time. Um, so that that increased emotional demand to have that, um, yeah. you know, facade on. Yeah, I mean, I mean, emotional labour is is a is a term you could use there, and um, yeah, I think I mean, I think organisations perhaps aren't, uh, you know, hopefully aren't doing. Uh, there, there certainly was, I think, a real a real um, tendency for this that, that organisations felt that actually just getting people to be more positive, and you know, that there was even explicit, I think, you know, values around coming to work with a positive mindset. Um, you know, I, I think I think all of that. Actually, and again, our research suggests that it tends to produce the very opposite of what you think you're trying to achieve. Um, so some of our work shows that if you do, if you are in a, an environment, a culture um, where, you know, where, where you feel that pressure to always maintain an, uh, that, that positive side of our emotional experience and avoid the negative, that actually you're more likely to become depressed, anxious, experience more negative emotion. Um, you know, it's often that, that, that very ironic part of it. Um, and, and I think organisations that, that do push that, um, and again, it not only does it does it sometimes lead to more of that. Um, it, it can obviously paint over existing problems that, that um, you know maybe their mental health concerns, the, the, the you know the real stuff that we need to be talking about. Um, and you know, actually, I was was you know reading reading a little bit on it that you know someone described it as a form of gaslighting. 
um, which I think is a nice way to think about it, telling me that, well, you know, it's all okay, keep your chin up, it's, it's all fine when it's actually not. Do you need more psych health and safety in your life? Then head over to the Flourish GX Academy for several free on-demand e-learning courses. If you're an internal professional, follow Flourish DX on Eventbrite to register for any of our free fortnightly interactive webinars. Our flagship professional practice program is also exclusively available for internal professionals. The 12-week course blends theory, applied practice and interaction with other professionals through live lectures and a monthly community of practice session. Find out more about all these learning opportunities or inquire about a bespoke in-house training at the Flourish DX Academy www.45003.org. Now back to this episode. Yeah, so can we maybe explore a little bit more about kind of how how this manifests in organisations and, and like what some of those maybe longer term consequences are for businesses who take that approach? Well, I think it, I mean, probably it manifests um, in two ways. I mean, for, certainly there's that, that explicit you know, the explicit way, which is where perhaps there's that, that stated objective or, um, uh, you know, sometimes the values of an organisation or how people are instructed to come to work. Um, I think that's less so the case these days. I, I think the way it manifests more these days is just a, uh, an inability to know how to res- respond to those elements of um, of human experience at work. So sometimes, again, people don't know quite how to step into conversations that are a little more uncomfortable or perhaps focused on some aspects of human functioning which aren't always positive and happy. Um, I think, I think you know, if, if, in, if an organisation, if the conversations um, going around are, are always positive, I think that's a real, a real danger sign. Um, I think you should be, you know, there should be at least 20% of your conversations that are uncomfortable and focused on difficult uh, issues and, and those aren't going to be always pleasant conversations um, that you're having. Um, perhaps focused on, again, aspects of our experience at work, which aren't always pleasant and positive as well. Um, so I think, again, it can really, um, I think longer term, it tends to paint over some of those very important factors we need to be discussing and talking about in the workplace. Um, and, and yeah, in, in that sense, I, I, I guess feeding into feeding into risk effectively, right? If, if we're not having those conversations, we're not dealing with those issues, we're not addressing that risk. Um, so long term, I think that's an issue. Um, but of course, also, ultimately, you know, it, it's not a culture or an environment or a workplace that people flourish in either. So it has that mental health impact too. Yeah, I, and I imagine that it would do things like impact or erode trust um, in the organisation as well that sort of, um, and it, I mean, yeah, almost some of those um, components of psychological safety of, of feeling like you can actually be yourself at work and express how you're feeling and, and those types of things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess that idea of authenticity is is really critical. Um, you know, I think toxic positivity, you know, pulls people away from that authenticity. And, and we certainly know that authenticity is important for for good leadership, uh, it's important for building positive cultures, for building psychologically safe cultures. Um, you know, a little bit of vulnerability sometimes around some of those aspects of our own functioning. Uh, you know, the, the ways in which we're working or um, the way we work. You know, how some of those issues that might arise being being able to actually be open and, and have those robust and uh, honest conversations around those. And of course, they're not they're not comfortable or easy to have. Um, so. So again, and, and some of our own work suggests even even things like failure, for example. So you know, some of our research has shown that people respond poorly to failure when they're in an environment where that positive messaging and that idea of of maintaining that upbeat and positive um, approach. Well, you actually feel worse about failure. You, you respond to it with rumination and worry. Um, and, and and of course, we're talking a lot about failing forward, failing fast, intelligent failure. Um, all of this is important for, for innovation, um, but also, I suppose, dealing with any kind of aspects of the workplace environment where people might make mistakes from time to time. Um, and, and, you know, when you felt that you have failed and you're in that kind of cultural environment, it, it, tends, to, it tends to go worse. Uh, you respond to that, that failure in a, in a worse way. Um, and again, I think you want people to be able to respond to failure well. Um, and that's, that's, you know, to, to have a, a functioning and productive, uh, positive workplace culture. 
Yeah, and certainly if you're looking at it from a, um, a work health and safety and in particular a process safety perspective, if people are um, are experiencing some type of failure, you want them to be able to speak up and say, hey, this went wrong, we need to do something about it. Um, otherwise, yeah. the, the potential escalations can really be catastrophic. Yeah, and, and I think... Um... And I think the process failures are actually the easy ones to talk about. Um, I mean, I like to think about, I mean, again, if you, if you do think about the sort of psychological health and safety um, aspect of this, you know, a lot of, a lot of that does come down to interpersonal relationships. Um, you know, there's a big social element to psychosocial risks, uh, even around, you know, some of those factors to do with job design and role you know, role clarity. Others. I mean, all of that is is mediated by relationships with your with your manager or your team members, and so being able to talk about, um, you know, talk about relationships where we've where we've managed those things well, but also where we perhaps haven't, um, and and perhaps where we've you know impacted negatively on people. Perhaps leaders have inadvertently uh, impacted on team members. You know, all of this is, I, I think, you know, critical to talk about in terms of. Well, where we perhaps haven't, we, we have maybe failed to create the environment or to treat people in the ways that we wanted to. Um, and to be able to talk about that in terms of growing and developing and building better approaches to, to how we work together, I think that's a really, really difficult conversation and a difficult area to, you know, to, to, to help people to feel comfortable talking about and understanding perhaps where they failed to meet some of their own expectations or, uh, or standards. Um, I think that's quite, quite complex. So um, you've obviously done a bit of research in this area. Um, could you summarize for us what are some of your key findings uh, on the topic of toxic positivity? Yeah, um, so certainly, um, you know, when, when people are, are surrounded, you know, by a culture, where they feel that uh, you know that that there's that expectation or pressure. We've found that um, in one in one study, we found that following people over a period of uh, of thirty days, and then looking at a network analysis of depressive symptoms, uh, you know, where you'd think maybe culture or the environment might be off to the side and might be just sort of influencing depression in that sort of indirect way, we actually found in that network analysis that. That, that sort of culture, if you like, of toxic positivity, if you want to call it that, um, was actually a very central uh, feature of, of that network of depressive symptoms. So, you know, I, I kind of like that finding in the sense that it, it puts culture and it puts the environment quite front and centre in terms of understanding something like depression. Um, and, and often we do see it as a very individual, um, you know, a very individual sort of thing when we talk about depression. So that, you know, I think that's... Uh, that's certainly one that got me quite excited, and I think is is certainly um, really really speaks to the importance of of thinking about these sorts of cultural factors. Yeah, no, um, that that network effect, like you say, is uh, is really interesting. It's uh, you know it goes well beyond just uh, individual and and um, their behaviours and and what they bring to the workplace. But yeah, we we're talking about um, uh, with John in our last podcast regarding the impacts of suicide, for example. You know, it goes yeah. well beyond just that person's decision to end their life. Um, and I think he, uh, the estimate was like 137 people or something that it impacts on. Um, so obviously suicide's a huge thing uh, and has dramatic effects on on a community of people, but so do our own behaviours and, and the culture that like as individuals we choose to bring or not bring into an organisation. So, yeah, yeah, quite interesting. Yeah, So how does your research then inform or help us to understand how to build mentally healthy workplaces? Well, I, I do think that, you know, culture um, plays a really important role in, in building a mentally healthy workplace. You know, I, I think if, you know, we, we know that culture is um, 10 times more important than, than, than salary or remuneration when it comes to employee engagement and satisfaction. So, you know, certainly um, thinking around and, and about the, the kinds of culture that we're that we're building. I mean, if you if you think around people's experience of work, you know, culture is a really critical resource for people, um, and and you know plays a central role in, in how they then 
experience the demands of their roles or other kinds of factors that perhaps are feeding into that demand side of the equation. So, you know, and I think often that, uh, you know, organisations don't always, we, we talk about culture, we use the word, but actually thinking about, well, what is it and how do we influence it and what do we need, need to do to actually build the kind of culture that we need to, to address issues and concerns, but also to support people and provide them with that resource is, um, yeah, it's really, really important. So I think certainly certainly that focusing that culture piece, I think, is, is really critical. And I think that's also one of those upstream factors, you know, if we are going to get in early and preventatively and deal with the sorts of issues that um, that we need to, uh, whether, whether they be psychosocial risks uh, or otherwise, um, you know, certainly getting upstream and looking at the culture is one of those. Um, and, and often that will feed into and influence some of those other sorts of factors that we, we need to be able to identify and address too. And so what sorts of approaches would you take to work towards culture change? Like I know there's sort of a measure, intervene, re-measure type of an approach, um, mm. which is, I guess, the, the standard org psych approach to something, but I'm not sure that it works well when you're talking about culture as your sort of yeah, I was going to ask change. actually about yeah the measure first. Like, how would you measure the culture? Yeah, so intervene, intervene. And I guess the the idea of having a normative thing that is culture and that that it, it's consistent sort of between organisations. If we understand culture as an emergent thing, um, yeah, I'm I'm not sure how that type of a um Normal a, a sta standardised yeah. measurement kind of an approach actually works or if it works at all when we're talking about culture so how how do you how do you do that Rob? <laughs> yeah. it's it's easy for us to say yeah just change the culture like yeah okay yeah, sure yeah all right <laughs> yeah well I, I mean I, the measurement issue is is certainly one um and you know i think i think sort of how do you measure it how do you how do you, you know i mean i think there are different ways to approach that and often you might be using existing data to try and infer um, you know what the culture is, but we, we can certainly measure culture. I mean, there are, there are a range of um, cross-cultural measures that we already know uh, in terms of measuring different cultures across countries, for example. So we can identify those cultural attributes uh, that exist. You know, whether it be across countries or across organisations. Um, again, you can be using existing data, or you can be using uh, other other forms of data to try and identify that. I think you can also just ask people directly. Uh, about about the culture, um, and I think sometimes we don't do that. One of the ways that you can actually measure culture is ask people what what they think everybody else thinks is the norm or the standard or the expectation, rather than what they personally might think, because that's what's actually the thing that's going to create the culture or influence my behaviour is not what I think, not the values or expectations or approaches that I might uh, hold myself, but what I think everybody else around me is doing. And of course, that's the norm. That's the, 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 the sort of uh, yeah, the cultural norm that I'm picking up on. And I think we can certainly, we can certainly measure that. Um, I'm not sure we often do though, uh, and I don't think many organisations are measuring culture in that way. And that that's quite fine. You know, whether we need to do that or not. I, I mean, whether we need to be directly, you know, measuring the culture in that sense. I mean, there's certainly measures out there, um, or whether we're looking at more those those you know those outputs or. Um, downstream impacts of culture, maybe we're looking at those sorts of measures more as a primary focus as well. Um, but then, you know, how do you influence it? And I guess, look, it, it comes down to, you know, individual behaviour at the end of the day, how people, um, what people do and, you know, what, what they bring to work, how we work together, how we manage those interactions, how we talk to each other, how we communicate, um, you know, that, that, that moment by moment, I think, you know, way of, Again, a, a great a great example with with psychological safety, for example, is is you know if you if I walk into your office and um, raise that difficult or uncomfortable issue and you give me a sort of signal or a sign that you're not very comfortable or don't appreciate that, well, you've pretty much killed that psychological safety in that interaction and in that moment. And my likelihood or willingness to come back and you know do that again is probably significantly reduced just simply from that interaction. So it's it's in those interactions and. The kind of skills and capabilities, particularly that leaders can bring to that, um, and to understand how their behaviour does shape and influence the culture, uh, and and then you know what what do you need to do in order to be able to create 
the kind of culture that you want. I think that's where it really, you know, really comes down to. So I think it's a lot about capability development. Yeah, and there's, yeah, that I guess that role of leaders in sort of creating the microculture in the team um, versus the broader organisational culture that is often, I guess, driven by more sort of the hierarchy and, and things like your business goals and those types of things. So there's tension there sometimes. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that even that broader culture, yeah, I mean, business goals is going to be important, value statements are going to be important, but probably, again, you know, your CEO is going to be very important. Um, you know, it's the people, it's the people in the organisation that are going to drive that culture and, and what they do and what they role model and, and what they say and how they address issues, um, you know, the way that they, they are, the way they lead. So I think I think that's going to probably have a bigger influence over culture than you know, some of those, some of the things we might sometimes look at, such as an organisation's priorities or value statements, that, those are important to have there and, and critical to have in place. Um, but yeah, it's people who create culture. So um, what's next then from a research perspective for you, Brock? Yeah, I think, I think certainly, um, you know, focusing and continuing to look at some of those broader um, societal, you know, those, those sort of, uh, I guess, Wicked problems, if you like, and, and, and the bigger conflicts um, that we need to think about managing better. Um, and, and, of course, a lot of that is going to feed into the ways in which organisations, I mean, a lot of the, you know, a lot of those sort of those those flashpoints of conflict in society are often also flashpoints in organisations with you know, around gender, for example. Um, you know, these are issues we need to know how to talk about and resolve um, and, and to open up and, and explore. Um, and often I don't think we're very good at that or we, we end up in a position where 74% of Australians wouldn't help someone who disagree with them, which is a terrible, a terrible statistic to be confronted with as a society. Um, and, of course, that's going to feed into all areas of life, including our work life. So, yeah, I think that's really where a lot of the work is going um, and, and then you know, through, I suppose, understanding some of those drivers of, um, you know, decision-making and the ways in which we manage um, those those difficult problems and, and communicate around those. Um, yeah, obviously that, that then has significant implications for, for well-being, broadly speaking, and mental health, uh, you know, across society, also within organisations. So, that, that's, I suppose, where it's, where it's heading at the moment, at least. Um, we'll see, you know. Sometimes research takes you in places that you don't expect to go. Yeah, I never thought I'd be working in the mental health space. So, yeah, whether, yeah, I, yeah, it's a long story about how I got there. But <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it can take you in weird and wonderful places. And like you say, when you um, have PhD students who go, hey, I'm actually really interested in this, and it can take you to a whole new place altogether as well. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Ideally, if, if you could give a message to employers in particular about takeaways from your research? What is there something you'd like them to start or to stop doing? Well, I think certainly, um, you know, recognising, I mean, we, we've got to recognise people are the most important asset to any organisation and that means, you know, we've got to understand them. Um, we've got to understand those more complex parts of human behaviour and take a, you know, take a fairly nuanced approach to that. I think a lot of you know, a lot of people aren't well equipped to to understand some of those more complex aspects of human behaviour, how we get along, how we how we manage, again, you know, uh, interpersonal conflict, uh, even how we un understand and unpack issues like bullying or harassment in the workplace. You know, these are these are complex issues, and we need to understand the the human factors around that. Um, I think too often we tend to focus again on individuals, character, you know. A victim perpetrator sort of model and that's very very hard to take an early intervention approach with when you sort of start with that assumption or start in that position um so i think i think certainly you know moving upstream and being able to to use some of those those behavioral insights that we do have um that we have developed in 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 psychology and social psychology to to really unpack um, those drivers of human behavior and then use those insights to to take that early intervention approach and to be able to see where the risks for perhaps, uh, you know, mental health or, or decision-making otherwise, where those exist, depending on exactly what problem you're trying to solve. Um, so I think that's that's certainly one thing. And 
I guess then looking after people as well. I mean, if people are your greatest asset, not only do you need to understand, you know, how why they do what they do or how they make the decisions they make and what drives their behaviour, but also how to look after them and how to make sure that, you know, I think, uh, again, you know, we can we can treat people, we can treat individuals. There's a great demand for psychologists um, and, and people seeking treatment for mental health complaints. You know, there's 25% of the Australian population are experiencing a mental health complaint in any given year. Um, I, you know, and we know a lot of a lot of that can be traced back to factors which increase job stress. Um, so if we can if we can address those sorts of factors at the organisational level and build workplaces where people spend, you know, hopefully not forty plus, but more often than not forty plus hours of their their working, or, you know, their waking their waking week. Um, if we can make those places better, then I think we're able to start to impact on some of those broader social issues, um, particularly around mental health and its, its prevalence, um, because I do think that those those are going to be, you know, we, we can have a bigger impact through organisations than we can at the level of individuals. Yeah, that, that was a big um, recommendation from the Productivity Commission Inquiry Report into Mental Health back in 2020, I believe, um, looking at the downstream costs of dealing with mental ill health at a community level. Uh, looking at the role of workplaces to do what was within their power to prevent mental ill health um, from work determinants um, primarily. So that was, I think, top five of the key recommendations out of that. Elevate yeah. psychological health and safety to the same level as physical health and safety. Yeah. Yeah. We're on the way. Yeah, it's a great, I mean, it's, it's a great model to be sort of being able to work off the back of too, isn't it? That, you know, people, people do understand that, that physical health and safety piece. So just, using that to help people to think about this broader picture, I think is really useful and, 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 you know, drawing those links for them, I think really does help. Yeah. So, uh, Brock, there's a question that we like to ask, uh, all guests at this point in the podcast, and that's to think with a future lens. Um, so if you were to look into the future, what would your hopes for workplace mental health be? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I mean, certainly, certainly, continuing on this this move upstream and this preventative uh, framework for for thinking about and, and and managing mental health. Again, I think it's it, it's great how you know in the last ten years, early intervention went from mental health awareness and talking about you know when people become mentally unwell and how to respond early to that, mental health first aid, through to you know what are the workplace factors and how do we have those sorts of conversations before people, you know, we need to talk about are you okay and those sorts of things. Of course, those conversations are critical, but I think continuing to to move further upstream, move those conversations further upstream. Um, and I suppose, yeah, just to recognise for organisations to really, I think, fully understand that longer-term perspective. I think it sometimes takes a certain risk appetite to invest heavily in, in the longer term perspective for an organisation. You can become very focused on your immediate goals, you know, your, your, your sort of profit margins and whatnot in the short term, meeting, me, meeting perhaps shareholder demands. But ultimately, in the long term, if you invest well in things like psychological health and safety, um, you know, you're going to drive performance, you're going to drive your costs down, you're going to, you know, end up with a better business and a better organisation. And and, and, you know, better people for it as well. So I think, you know, the more that we can continue to take that long-term view on the problem and, and the more that organisations can continue to do that, I think, you know, that'd be that'd be great to see. 100%. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> uh, all right. Last question for you, Brock, before we let you go. Do you have any words of advice for listeners who are interested in working in the field of psychological health and safety? Yeah, look, I, I think it's a, a fascinating area. It's 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 complex. It's um, you know, it's it's not only thinking about people who are complex enough, but it's thinking about groups of people, um, and 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 how groups of people you know get along and uh, and and operate and and um, work together and the dynamics within that. And you know, I, I think it's a really really interesting space. And so, I, I think you know, I think if if you are moving into that into that area and maybe as you said jason you're not, you might not be aware you are until you do and maybe later later in your studies you might pick it up but um i think it's a really interesting and fascinating space to be applying psychology um and and you know i think that, that it's it's a really valuable space as well because as we just said it's one of those 
those those areas you can really I think create some some broad societal benefit from if you if you do it well. Yeah, and um, almost guaranteed that if you are an organisational psychology psychologist working in a business, once they realise we need to do something around psychosocial safety, they're probably going to come and ask you for help anyway, regardless of whether that's actually your job or not. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Absolutely. It's like, yeah. it's like the meme that you shared um, today. Yeah. 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 Nice. Well, uh, Brock, it's been uh, great having you on the podcast finally after uh, 200 plus episodes, three years, we finally got, got you on. So really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing a bit about your research. No problem at all. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Cool. Well, uh, listeners, that brings us to the end of this episode. Um, remember, we do video these when we have our guests on, so you can catch those videos on the Flourish DX YouTube channel. Uh, we also do take the snippets, the the bits of gold from these podcasts, and we put them on the Flourish DX LinkedIn page, so do follow along there. Uh, while you're on LinkedIn, uh, Brock, Joel, myself are all pretty friendly, so if you want to continue the conversation, uh, feel free to slide into our DMs. All right, well, uh, that's it for today. We'll catch you next episode. You've been listening to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. To stay up to date with the latest on psychological injury prevention, follow Flourish DX on LinkedIn and subscribe to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast at www.psychhealthandsafety.com.